Welcome to the 700 Club. Here's a quote for you. We will not let up until they are returned. That's a pledge from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to free the hostages captured by Hamas. A possible deal that could release 50 hostages or more may be underway. It could also include a pause in the fighting in Gaza. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us the story from Jerusalem. Families of Israeli hostages gathered outside Israel's military headquarters in Tel Aviv ahead of their meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet last night. Netanyahu told the families that the return of the hostages is a sacred mission and that he and his friends are responsible for their return. But for the families, it didn't go far enough. What we've heard is that taking down Hamas and bringing the hostages are as important, are equally important. As far as I am concerned, and I represent myself and my family, this is incredibly disappointing. Udi Gorin, whose cousin Tal Haimi is being held captive in Gaza, says he believes the return of the hostages should be the top priority right now. Nevertheless, he says, it makes sense that details of any deal are a secret. It makes, you know, it just takes common sense to understand that if they told us about the, 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 the details of the deal that is now being done, then it might jeopardize it. Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh says a deal is close. Agence France Press reporting 50 to 100 Israeli and foreign civilian hostages would be released in exchange for around 300 Palestinians in Israeli jails. The deal would include humanitarian aid into Gaza and a five-day truce. The U.S. also continues to hint at a soon-coming deal for the release of at least part of the hostages. Uh, but as you heard the deputy national security advisor say yesterday, uh, we believe we're closer than we've ever been. So we're hopeful. Uh, but, uh, but there's still work to be done, um, uh, and nothing is done until it's all done. Inside Gaza, fighting continues. Over the last day, the Israel Defense Forces says they struck some 250 terror targets, including dozens of terrorists, rocket launchers, and terrorist infrastructure. According to the IDF, one rocket launching post was located in a civilian residential area. Terrorists launched a heavy barrage of rockets from that Gaza location toward Tel Aviv yesterday. Troops also found a weapons stockpile in the residence of a senior terrorist, including in a baby's room. The fighting is not limited to Gaza and southern Israel. Along the northern border, heavy exchanges of fire as Hezbollah launches rockets at communities with Hezbollah causing heavy damage to an Israeli army base. Hezbollah, which is backed by Iran, has launched regular and escalating attacks since October 7th, but so far no signs it plans a full-scale assault. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, joining us now is Michael Oren. He's the former Israeli ambassador to the United States. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Always good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, what's your take on the uh, on a, the possibility that there's a hostage deal? Well, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is we're dealing with Hamas. Hamas never negotiates in good faith. Zero. They're talking about moving the football all the time. Um, they'll say they'll release uh, 80 hostages, then they'll come around, they'll say 50 or 40 or 30. And then they'll say we'll do it in return for a five-day truce, and they'll get to the end of the five-day truce, and we still won't have all the hostages. All right? So it's always going to be... Uh, breaking the ceasefire. They have broken every single ceasefire we've ever reached with them. So this won't be unique. Um, so that's the beginning of it. And then there's the great dangers. The great dangers is that, uh, you know, a five-day ceasefire, Thomas is going to use that time to booby trap the, uh, the tr more of the Gaza Strip, to, uh, to uh, rearm, to regroup. And at the end of it, they're going to be pressed for another ceasefire. And say if they release 50 hostages, the families of the other hostages are going to say, well, what about our families? Let's have another ceasefire. And the bottom line is this. A ceasefire means Hamas wins. A ceasefire means Hamas gets away with mass murder. A ceasefire means that Israel cannot restore peace to its borders. We have 250,000 people who are homeless tonight. They can't go back to their homes. Israel, you know, large parts of the country with a ceasefire will remain uninhabitable. Israel loses. So it's all about the ceasefire, and it's very, very dangerous. 
Well, uh, explain to me how Hamas is still able to launch rockets into Israel. And there just seems to be a disproportionate media coverage of that event, that everything seems to be focused on the two hospitals in Gaza. And, and I, I still, from just a military standpoint, I don't see how Hamas is still firing rockets. So uh, I know that's two questions in there. So let's take the first one. Uh, how, how, are they still, how are they still firing rockets? And then the second one, why the disproportionate media coverage? Well, it begins with, first of all, where the rockets being fired from. As, as Julie Stahl reported, they're being far, far, fired from residential areas, from mosques, from schools, uh, from around hospitals. It's hard for us to get at them. Some of these rocket launchers are underground, and the ground opens up, and the rockets come up, and then closes down again. And what you got is a plot of sand or rock uh, over it, and it's difficult to actually see them. Uh, we can destroy them after they fired, so they can't be fired again. Um, as for the press conference, uh, the press coverage, uh, this happens at every war. Every war, we get a certain amount of grace period because of the fact that we're attacked first, but that ends very quickly. And the focus goes from Jewish suffering to Palestinian suffering. And that's precisely what Hamas wants. Hamas wants us to kill as many Palestinians as possible. That's why Hamas uses its population as human shields. Why? Because every Palestinian that is killed, however tragically, in this war, and it is tragic, uh, increases the international pressure for a ceasefire which is what Hamas needs. It needs it to survive, and it needs to come back needs it to come back and try to kill us again, which is what it's all about. And their leaders have actually said this. Once we get through this, we're going to do it again and again and again, which is precisely why Israel can never agree to a ceasefire, not a real one, not a prolonged one, and can never stop until Hamas is destroyed. Does that just underline that Israel can literally win every single battle, every single war, but still can't win the peace. Uh, it's because of the ideology that's taken hold in the Palestinian community. It's not just in the Palestinian community. It's not just an ide ideology, it's theology. People who believe that through violence, through massacre, uh, they can recreate a, a medieval caliphate in the Middle East that will then expand and, and take over the world. That's literally their theology. And there's no difference between the theology of Hamas and Al-Qaeda and ISIS. They're all exactly the same. So that's what we're fighting against. What we can fight, what we can, can do is keep fighting, keep winning. And there will be certain uh, Arab populations like those of Egypt, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, Bahrain, that will internalize that this is not the way to go forward. And this is not the way to promise a better future for your children and grandchildren. And they'll make peace with us. Uh, the Palestinians are not there yet. And certainly not the Palestinians who support Hamas. Unfortunately, the recent polls show that 83% of the Palestinians uh, in Judea and Samaria, in the West Bank, and 65% in Gaza still support Hamas. Well, President Biden said over the weekend that the Palestinian Authority should govern Gaza after the war. In light of what you just said about their ideology, their theology, um, it, it, can, can that ever work? Well, not with the Palestinian Authority the way it is now. And now it's headed by Mahmoud Abbas who's in the 18th year of his four-year term because he won't stand for re-election. He knows that Hamas is going to win. This is Mahmoud Abbas, who just a month before October 7th, on September 7th, gave one of the most anti-Semitic uh, speeches in history, blamed the Jews for bringing on the Holocaust on themselves. Get this. This is a man who wrote his PhD thesis denying the Holocaust. So, and, and he is fabulously corrupt. Uh, the Palestinians don't like him, obviously. And uh, most recently, he blame the Israeli army, the IDF, for perpetrating the massacres uh, on October 7th. It wasn't Hamas, it was the Israeli army that shot all those uh, concert goers. Uh, so this is the man you're dealing with. I don't think he's a peace processor, uh, partner. The Palestinian Authority pays Palestinian prisoners in our prison who have murdered Israelis, pays them salaries, pays these stipends. We get more for killing more Jews. So it's called pay for slay. Uh, things have to change. So the Palestinian Authority maybe could be a partner, but not the Palestinian Party the way it is now. Uh, there's not really not all that much difference between them and Hamas. Is there any hope here? Um, could, could somehow the countries who have already signed on to the Abraham Accords, could they form uh, some kind of governing entity? Is there, is there any hope for the future? Yes. Uh, first of all, yes, I get. I think a there is a chance that, that the uh, signatories to the Abraham Accords and other peace agreements uh, could contribute to a force that would be an intra-Arab force um, with American backing. 
uh, that could govern uh, Gaza and rebuild Gaza, and actually build an infrastructure. It didn't have an infrastructure because Hamas stole it all. And as for hope, you know, I'm a believing man, okay? So I have to believe, and I know that uh, we are here for a purpose. We've been around for 4,000 years. We're still here. Uh, and that uh, the promises made to us in that book that we both hold so dear, um, those are true promises, and we're not going anywhere. Well, let's look at one of the major problems, and that is Iran. It, it's the major funder for Hamas, Hezbollah, um, the, the terror groups yeah. there. They've stated they want to wipe Israel off the map. Uh, so what's it going to take to, to get a coalition to say, uh, it's time for that to stop. It's time for there to be a new government there. It won't happen until the United States recognizes that the longstanding policies of try policy of trying to appease Iran, of trying to hope that Iran will become, quote unquote, a uh, responsible regional actor, as the words of, of President Obama, until they realize that that was a total failed policy. And that uh, if someone once believed that by appeasing Iran, America could, could disengage from the Middle East, just the opposite is, is true. By empowering Iran, America gets dragged back into the Middle East uh, because Iran will touch off wars. And I think Iran was instrumental in triggering this war in undermining pro-Western governments throughout the Middle East, a source of unending instability and violence, the world's largest state sponsor of terror. Um, so it's not appeasable. No more than, more than Hamas was appeasable. Uh, and once America makes a decision saying, okay, we made a mistake, now we're going to change things, that type of coalition can't be truly effective. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your insight. And I encourage you to stay, stay hopeful and, and continue to be the light to the nations that you so are. Uh, let's, let's hope for peace and let's pray for peace in Israel and in Jerusalem. Thanks for being with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bye.